My name's John Lloyd and I'm the Professor of Ignorance at the University of Buckingham. Welcome to the Museum of Curiosity and the opening of our new and currently empty second gallery. Those of you who visited our first gallery will know that curator Bill Bailey and I amassed a seemingly impossible collection, including the Battle of Waterloo, a pineapple and the Big Bang when it was the size of a grapefruit. <laughs> Joining me is my latest acquisition. It's our new curator, Mr. Sean Locke. So what am to Bill Bailey, Sean? Uh, he was headhunted by the uh, Pencil Museum in Cumbria. <laughs> and I think he's done a refurb on Wookie Hole. <laughs> so you guaranteed laughs if you put Wookie Hole in a sentence. <laughs> in any context whatsoever. Even if you say a very close friend of mine died in Wookie Hole. <laughs> You're still going to laugh, wouldn't you? So, anyway, yeah, Bill's, no, but Bill's before he left, he took you on a tour of did, uh, Gallery yes. One, I gather. So, yeah. um, how is the museum looking? Well, I've got a big problem because you've got the big bang in there. It's taken up a lot of room. <laughs> it's moving around the place. And of course, there's Brian Blessed's Yeti causing all kinds of uh, havoc and mayhem. And Brian visits the Yeti every now and again. <laughs> and I don't know what they do. <laughs> but he's definitely got a purpose because he turns up, he's very excited, and he leaves exhausted. <laughs> right, let's introduce this week's three illustrious guests from our steering committee, and they are Brian Eno, Chris Donald, and Dave Gorman. <laughs> let's spend some time getting to know them, starting with you, Brian. Musician, artist, perfume maker... Diarist, record producer, it's been said that to try and describe the life of Brian Eno is like trying to fold a skyscraper into a suitcase. Well, you've done such a ridiculous number of things in your life. When people say, you know, on a plane or whatever, what you do and you want privacy, what do you say? Well, I got so sick of that question because if I said I was a musician, they would always say, so do you know Alton John or something like that? <laughs> or, or can you get me tickets for such and such a concert? So I, I used to just lie and I, I remember one flight... I said to the lady next to me who asked that question that I was a patents attorney. <laughs> and she said, really? Well, so am I. <laughs> and I spent a very long journey tap dancing around the fact that I didn't want to talk about my work. <laughs> how, how about you, Dave? Did you ever have a way of getting out of saying what you do? You, on pain of death, do you reveal that you're a comedian to a taxi driver? <laughs> um, <laughs> What does he do? Well, the worst I've had was a taxi driver who literally said to me, I don't mind the racism and the sexism because that's all part of it. It's the bad language I don't like. <laughs> Chris, do you have an excuse of what you... You um, don't say I'm the, I'm the creator of Viz or No, no, no. I did a very useful apprenticeship in the DHSS, as it was called in those days. I worked for the overseas branch of the Department of Health and Social Security. So I tell people I'm a clerical officer in the DHSS. Oh, and if they, ask any, if they go any further than that, I say I deal with administering the national insurance contributions of people who are working abroad in <laughs> non-reciprocal countries such as the <laughs> USA <laughs> and the United Arab Emirates, people whose national insurance numbers end in 43, 44, <laughs> 42 uh, C and D, because that is what I did. Now, Brian, for, for somebody who's produced all my favourite albums and, you know, you, you describe yourself as a non-musician? Yes, I did, because right. I couldn't really play anything. Right. But I can play recording studios, that's, that's really what I play. Did you invent ambient music, is that your term? Yeah, you yeah. Now it's its own category in record shops. Is it? I notice, yes, full of records that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that you're doing is this kind of stuff where you're programming music that never repeats itself. Yeah. That strikes me as a very interesting idea. Yeah. Well, a long uh, time ago, I thought it would be so nice to make pieces of music that existed like paintings that just stayed in one place for a very long time and that you entered and left as you felt like it, rather than a piece of music that has a beginning, a middle and an end. So I invented systems whereby the music constantly produced itself differently. And that's what I call generative music, which is my next thing from your after ambient yeah. music. Your next category. Yes, that isn't yet in the record shops. <laughs> so, Brian, just briefly, what's the long now, then? Is that what you're talking about? 
13 years ago, I started with some friends an organization called the Long Now Foundation, which is um, dedicated to long-term thinking. We decided to take a frame of 10,000 years and to try to think 10,000 years ahead. Right. So your bit of music lasts, will last 10,000 years? Oh, yeah, we won't even be past the intro. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, now we're going to play you a piece of... Well, we're going to play the whole, actually, of a Brian Eno composition. Here we go. That's uh, the Windows startup theme. <laughs> That's Windows 95. It was it? Is yeah, it? It's, they don't use it anymore, of course. Did you write that on a PC? No, I wrote it on a Mac. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never used a PC in my life. I don't like them. I gave them 83 pieces, so... Really? I think 83? Some... What were yeah. the more outlandish ones? <laughs> <laughs> did it, did it, did it. <laughs> it was very funny when I got the job because they sent me a quite long letter and it said the piece of music should be inspirational, sexy, driving, provocative, nostalgic, <laughs> sentimental. <laughs> it went on and on. There were about 150 adjectives. And then at the bottom it said, and not more than 3.8 seconds long. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Eno. My next guest <laughs> comes from a long and fine tradition of entrepreneurial brothers. Just as Romulus and Remus founded Rome, the Wright brothers invented the aeroplane, Chris Donald and his brother Simon gave the world Johnny Fartpants, the Fat Slags, Roger Melly, the man from the telly, and Buster Gonad in one <laughs> sublimely naughty comic called Viz. Auburn War, no less, once described you and the other creators of Viz as modern-day Jonathan Swifts. How do you feel about that? Um, well, I'm immensely flattered because it was, after all, just a bit of a sort of a toilet joke magazine. <laughs> but uh, we did get some highbrow um, pats on the back, yes. Yeah, but it's fair. If, I mean, I don't know of any other publication. I've seen people sitting on trains laughing out loud, really <laughs> laughing. That's quite unusual. You know, so I love the marketing policies you had as well, didn't you? You had the balloon. Free oh, balloon. Yeah, the, uh, we used to do free gifts. We had a free balloon. That was the best free gift we did because it was stapled to the back page. <laughs> <laughs> we, we never reached those heights again. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you also... You, you bought the rights to Johnny Vegas's wedding? Um, yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, it was for five pounds or something. <laughs> <laughs> did you get into quite a lot of trouble? You sued a lot? We weren't actually sued. Well, yes, we were, but not, not <laughs> sort of properly. The, the first person who got any money that we settled out of court was a bloke who, who had a house in Tyne and Weir, and we'd used a photograph of his house in a story. It was about a man who'd um, made love to himself. Um, and he said, I made love to myself um, while I watched. That was the headline. <laughs> and there was a, a, just a photograph of the man's house, and the owner of the house spotted it, and we ended up paying him £100. <laughs> to go away but we had little run-ins with various individuals we called somebody a tart and I mean it seemed appropriate at the time but the dictionary definitions of tart are fairly strict it's either a fruit pie or it's a, a prostitute <laughs> and uh, she, she demonstrably wasn't a fruit pie so we were, we were knackered well anyway you've, you've kind of given all that up now and you run a bookshop for a while in, in Annick and, yes. and you spend your days collecting full-size train stations, is that right? It was like an ambition of mine to, to live in an old railway station. And when I made a few bob, I bought one. And then I bought another one, because another one came up, and I ended up having three <laughs> railway stations and a signal box in a crossing keeper's <laughs> cottage. But, um, no, we lived in one. I turned one into um, the world's most geographically remote restaurant, which was um, <laughs> up a mountain in Northumberland. <laughs> Um, and that was not a success. <laughs> well, I just want to quote one line from Viz, which is from Top Tips, and it goes like this. Press Rice Krispies into the treads of your car tyres for that expensive gravel drive look. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Donald.
And thirdly, Dave Gorman is a comedian and author whose CV reads like a choose-your-own-adventure book. He's traversed the planet, allowing each step to be dictated entirely by serendipity. In one 30-day experiment, for example, he followed the newspaper horoscopes to the letter to see if they would improve his life. And uh, did they? Um, the, the figures showed that they did, but the reality was rather different. Uh, and at the end of the experiment, we, we went through it all and we measured um, health, wealth and happiness with the help of an audience and a, an agony aunt and, and people. Uh, and we, we sort of put them all together. And because I won a lot of money on the final day, it showed that astrology had won. But if, you, if we'd had a 29-day experiment, it would have tanked. <laughs> Everything was going horribly wrong, and then all of a sudden I'm in Dubai winning something like £6,000 by betting on Ian Woosnam. Uh, and, it, and it suddenly gives it a great result. Tell us about Genius, because I came across Genius on the radio, and now it's on telly on BBC Two. Yes. Members of the public send in apparently mad, but often other brilliant ideas. But give us an example. We had a 14-year-old boy, I think, whose idea, his, his email literally just said, Dear Genius, how about Tetris the movie? <laughs> And your head starts to melt the moment you even think about it. Um, but we'd, we, when we do this, I remember having a big argument because we were doing this for radio, and I was saying, OK, I'm going to bring in a screen and a projector, and we're going to see whether or not an audience can engage with the narrative of Tetris <laughs> as a way of testing the idea. And he goes, it's on radio. You're doing this. But actually, I, I, I've listened to that show back recently, and you can hear the audience. You know exactly what's going on, and you've just got this mad rabble of an audience all going, left, left, <laughs> rotate. Rotate! No, left, left! And it's, it's weirdly kind of actually, I think, better than watching that. It's, you can absolutely see what, the kind of chaos in your head. Yeah. I like this one, um, an MP3 microwave. What's that? Instead of just the normal hmm, ding, uh, you'd find a piece of music in your MP3 player that lasted exactly as long as the dish needed to cook. So you'd put, you'd put the thing in, you shut the microwave, it would play a tune that you like that lasts exactly as long as it takes, and when it's finished, your meal's ready. So you, you could definitely do that, Brian. That's definitely. I'd, I'd be very pleased to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think the million-year stew. <laughs> 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 the Microsoft Windows pot noodle. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good idea. That. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I like that idea. You, and when you did Dave Gorman, when you are you Dave Gorman? How many Dave Gormans did you find? Uh, well, the whole point was that I was trying to find 54. There was one for every card in the deck, including the Jokers. Right. Um, but they haven't stopped looking for me, so I've now met 108. Right. Because that year there were 144 Dave Gormans on the UK electoral roll. Now there are only 88. What? <laughs> That's 56 have disappeared, or as normally it's called, possibly died or emigrated, because they're fed up of being chased by you. you know? <laughs> no, I don't know. They're, they're apparently there's, well, there's a natural wastage, obviously. You can live, you know, one or two might shuffle off the mortal coil. Yeah. What's happened to all the Dave Gormans? He's eliminating the competition, mm. obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Are you killing them, Dave? Is it elaborate well, this cereal? wasn't the forum I was planning on. <laughs> and, and ironically, because it's, it's not many people know this, but Dave Gorman is actually a stage name, uh, and my real name is John Lloyd. So, uh, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, well. Dave Gorman. <laughs> Well, we must get on because now it's time for our distinguished advisory panel to lift the veil on their museum exhibits. Mr. Curator, over to you. Yes, thank you, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> you don't believe I, me, do I, you? I could, I could have invested that word, Professor, no. with less contempt, could I? Um, <laughs> no, thank you, Professor. This is my first day. The museum is now in the receive position. <laughs> Chris, may we have your submission, please? Um, yes, I have it here. I've brought it along. It's um, a bridge plate. I don't know if you're familiar with bridge plates, anyone. This is a North Eastern Railway bridge plate. Um, you probably wonder where it's from. It's from a bridge. bridge... <laughs> Which bridge, you say? Well, it's from bridge number 45. <laughs> That's why it has 45 written on it. And to me, this sort of represents everything that is good about train spotting. Um, people imagine that train spotting is a very shallow occupation, that you just sit there and spot trains. But there's more to it than that. You can spot anything to do with the railway. You can indeed collect the numbers of the bridges, because they all have numbers. If you think about it, if you ran a railway and it had loads of bridges on it, you'd have to give them numbers, because you've got to repair them and maintain them, and the blokes can say, which bridge do I fix today? And you can't say, oh, the third one along after such and such. You've got to tell them, go fix bridge number 45. So there's a reason for it. There's, there's a plate missing from it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Um, not only the bridges were numbered, clocks, railway clocks were all numbered as well. I um, bought a railway station and um, I wanted a clock to go on the wall, an authentic clock. And um, I got in touch with a doctor, a doctor of railway clocks. And he said, um, I can get you the exact clock. He had a book which had the number of every railway clock ever made in. And he looked up the clock that had been in my station, and I found out that it had gone from my station to Hexham Station to Prudder Station from where it had retired. And he had a record of this clock's movements, and he was able to tell me who'd bought the clock. Ooh. So I went and found the man who bought the clock, and I bought the clock from him. And so the clock returned to the station, all because it had a number on it. Because the railways like numbering things, and, and I, <laughs> I like things to be numbered. <laughs> I don't know why, I just do. And the idea that every bridge had a number like that attached to it appeals to me. And it appeals to a lot of people. This is a very collectible item. Because when Dr. Beeching closed all the railways down, people imagined they were all scrapped, but they weren't. They were cut up into teeny bits and sold in auctions. And train spotters like railways because it's all quantifiable. They know how many trains there are because they're all numbered. They have a book with all the numbers in it. And so it's all very controlled and they can understand it, and it's very two-dimensional. Like, I don't like buses as much as I like trains, because, <laughs> yes, they have numbers on, um, but you don't know where the buses are. They could have gone out to a ferry, they could be anywhere. But trains, you stand on the platform, you look at the track, and you know that that metal bit of track on the floor is touching every train that you're looking for. And you understand that it's a puzzle that can be solved. And that's why that's... <laughs> Is there a person I've ever heard uh, someone as articulate as you talk about train spotting and make it, made it seem like, you know, not, not like, it made, like it made good sense, <laughs> but that there's a reason, there's some reasoning behind it, it's behind you? the purpose, not just a sort mm. of like manic collection and connecting of numbers. Or, so I've got mm. a list of famous train spotters here, Michael Palin, W.H. Auden, Alfred Hitchcock and Pete Waterman. Did you know wow. Pete Waterman no, was a train spotter? I, I yeah. sold Pete Waterman a, a, a nameplate off a train. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pete Waterman, if you go to his recording studio, which I have done, I don't know if it's still the same, it was the hit factor they called him. Mm. It was a, a little building. He had Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan sort of in one room making hit records and then in this other room he had this man <laughs> spending all the profits or make, using up the money making little brass engines for him like lovely <laughs> O-scale detailed models. But he also buys real trains. He collects real diesel trains. Is this why Kylie's does. first hit was the locomotion? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be at all surprised. I wouldn't be at all surprised. <laughs> Uh, here's something I didn't know. That in the First World War, some of the most valuable military intelligence was collected by train spotters. They were sent by the government to Luxembourg, which was a big railway hub, and collected loads of information by watching where the supplies were going. Did you know I that can, I can believe that, yeah. yes. Sean, we need to know where, where you're going to put this in the museum. There we are. Have we got any thoughts for that? Just maybe on the front door? Yes, yeah, that's Is a good it? idea. Well, I'll put it next to number 46. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, we've got a... A vote for there, the British Railways bridge plate in the museum. Thank you very much. There you are, now, Brian, what, what would you like to add to our collection? Well, I decided to bring along a volcano. In fact, it's the biggest volcano in Iceland. And I believe it's called Grimsvutten, though um, I'm not sure how you pronounce Icelandic words. <laughs> so I will, I will assume yeah. that if I put my finger across my upper lip and say, Grim's button. That's, that's probably what it's called. It's one of the biggest active volcanoes in the world, and it's central to Iceland's geothermal industry. Iceland produces about 20% of its energy just by tapping the stuff that comes up out of the ground. And in fact, about 90% of their energy is um, sustainable, so renewable energy. It seems, OK, lucky Iceland, they're sitting on a volcano. In fact, we're, we're all sitting on a volcano, actually, because there's a hot core to the Earth, so that it's now possible, because of new drilling technologies, to penetrate and to have geothermal energy anywhere on the planet. Southampton, funnily enough, uses geothermal energy, and there's now a project in County Durham, a little village called Eastgate, which is going to become Britain's first geothermal energy village, ent entirely powered by geothermal energy. So it's, it's very easy to get. Uh, you drill two holes um, into hot rock. You put water down one of the holes, and it comes out of the other as steam, and you drive a turbine from mm. the steam. I, I like that um, 
one little country, which is now, of course, completely bankrupt, is, is leading the world in this technology, and hopefully um, it will help them get back on their feet. How far would you have to drill to, to run a city on this stuff? Um, Southampton went down, I think, 1,400 metres. They went to a, a hot water aquifer under the city, and they, they now derive 10% of the energy for Southampton from, from that. The only problem is, I went to Iceland. Um, the thing is that there, they had certainly had some of the problem that when you had a shower, it always smelt of poo. Sulfur, yes. Because it, and so you come out of the shower absolutely stinking of rotten eggs. It's the most extraordinary thing. You, you get used to it, then. Yeah, no, it's OK. <laughs> I mean, once everybody smells of it, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I always worry that if, you're, if everyone sort of, it's like trepanning the world, sort of digging these holes in, and it will just let all the heat out, and then it will run out really quickly, so it's like you're, all the steam will run away, and then if, if mm. every country does it, then we'll somehow screw over Iceland. This later. is a really yes, interesting thing. The, the, the centre of the Earth, there's t you know, you only have to go down a few miles, what's it, only 4,000 miles. Is it to the middle, is the Earth yeah, about? Yeah, just under, yeah. And the temperature down there is about 7,000 degrees centigrade mm -hmm. celsius so so that is about the same as the temperature of the surface of the sun mm -hmm. now how's that what's that what's generating all that heat it's a nuclear reaction basically is that well, what it is a lot of it is left over from um you know it, it is actually a memory of the creation of the universe so so a lot of that is stored heat that's still there why isn't it you know why um, doesn't run it run out well there's a lot of it in fact it's calculated that there are thirteen thousand zeta joules of energy in the earth that's um, 13 followed by 24 zeros Blimey. 13,000 zeta joules oh, it takes yeah. a long time to get through that there's dinosaurs down there as well in that journey to the yeah. center of the earth <laughs> <laughs> I've got a note here that says Iceland's most famous poet and historian Snorri Sturluson I don't know how to pronounce that Snorri, Snorri Sturluson <laughs> 1178 to 1241, his dates are, tapped the Earth's heat for a pool in his backyard. <laughs> According to the medieval Icelandic sagas, the thermal pool in his garden at Reykholt as warm to the touch as it was when Snurry built it almost a thousand years ago. Oh, Isn't that that's amazing? Sweet. Yes. Well, uh, my suggestion is uh, to put the uh, Grimsverton into the boiler room to provide that's the heating and hot water for the museum. So that's my vote. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, Dave, uh, the museum is still in the receive position. Um, um, what have you got for us? Well, I'm assuming the donate position. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to donate um, the urge to press red buttons that you know you shouldn't press. Right. <laughs> Perhaps if you've ever used a disabled toilet, um, which you shouldn't do, Sean, because you're not disabled. But if you ever do, uh, I always see there's a kind of, there's always like, there's the flush, and then there's a red cord. <laughs> and then I spend the entire time fantasizing about pulling it by accident, and I, and I know I want to. And on trains where they have the emergency brake, mm. uh, and at the airport where there's the, the baggage carousel, they always have a big red button there saying, in emergency only, it stops it, but don't press it. Every time I see one of those buttons, I want to. Do you know what happens when you do pull that red cord? Um, no, I don't. A load of uh, people come rushing towards you, right? And then you just open the door and go, I'm cured! <laughs> <laughs> and they think it's wonderful, it's a miracle. They phone up the local paper. Yeah. And obviously that's when you have to make yeah. your excuses and leave yeah. at that point. I'm cured and my wheelchair has evaporated. Yes. <laughs> I have it with, in a social situation. Yeah. I have that urge. It's when you meet someone who is... But, you know, very nice, benign. Not very close to you, usually like a sort of a friend's uncle who you've met, you've gone over to their house and said, oh, this is my uncle, he's a very nice bloke. And in a way, you sort of feel like somehow you've made this judgment that he's like a better person than you. And uh, I get this thing, what would happen if I punched him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would be a really bad thing to do. It'd be, it would really point out that this person didn't deserve that at all. And, and, I've, and I've, I've spoiled everything if I punch them. And I don't punch them. No. Very, very rarely. Very rarely. <laughs> I mean, imagine crush. being Probably Barack Obama, true. President of the United States, there is now a, a, an amazing thing, there's a button that only he can really mm. press. 
and he must have, and part of him must be fantasising about pressing that button. <laughs> I don't think there's a big aren't red buttons. one like that, Dave, like they have no, on game they're... shows, though. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine there's a, like a cabinet with a lock, and you open it, and yeah. then you get the key out, and then you go to another desk, and you unlock that, and you pull that out, and there's a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's this box, and you have to smash the box open with the hammer. And inside there's an Allen key. <laughs> and you take that, and that opens a door with a little train. <laughs> which takes you underground. <laughs> I, I'm glad it's nothing like a game show. <laughs> The truth is, apparently, they have these nuclear briefcases, which you sometimes see a, an aide carrying the yeah. president has, and uh, they look a bit like a laptop inside. Mm -hmm. So it's quite complicated. It, it's mm. not just a button. I'm, I'm glad it's quite complicated. Mm. <laughs> but oddly, on British nuclear submarines, it's m even simpler. They, they don't have any of this thing. They've just, they just left-click on the mouse, and it sends the missile off. <laughs> It's not, it's terrifying, isn't it? Oh, no. Yes. Or more to the point, in fact, there's just some submariner who's trying to update his Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, all the ones I was talking about before, like on trains and in disabled toilets and, and whatever, they are always red. Mm. And, I, and I sort of know subliminally that if they were green, I would have less of an urge to push them. Yeah, yeah. Mm. There's something that is appealing about the colour red, even, and they have, please, do not press, written on a button. You, you, that somehow draws your hand... Towards yeah. it. Yes, do you know what yes. I'm going to do, Dave, one day? Yeah. I'm going to take you out. It's like your birthday. Yeah. And I'm going to have a big roll of cash. All right, we're going to go on the tubes, trains, and I'm going, <laughs> press it, Dave. Uh, uh, I'm just going to count off a few. <laughs> 50 quid. Go on. Now, go and press that one. Yeah. That Push day, Sean, button. when you and me, we just go and inconvenience the capital. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for that. <laughs> Well, what, what should it be kept in? I think it should just be a room with a big red button in it right. saying, do not press. And if you do press it, you're ejected from the museum. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll have Dave's uh, urge to press buttons you shouldn't in the museum. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, in the museum this week, we've got an active volcano, a Northeastern British Railways uh, board bridge plate. Northeastern Railways bridge plate number 45. Number 45, and the urge to press buttons that should be left unpressed. And my thanks to the members of our splendid steering committee, Brian, Chris and Dave. Thank you very much, everybody. That's all from the Museum of Curiosity. The Museum of Curiosity was created by John Lloyd and Sean Locke with research by QIs James Harkin and Molly Oldfield. The exhibits were kindly donated by Dave Gorman, Chris Donald and Brian...